What's up guys and welcome to One Take. I'm Gil and today we're talking about The Expanse Season 5 Episode 6 titled Tribes. This will be a full recap and review so it'll be full of spoilers through Episode 6 but no book spoilers so nothing from any future episodes. I thought this was a solid episode and a step up from last week's. We saw some very powerful character moments. We see Avasarala more rattled than I think we've ever seen her before. We see Amos and Clarissa both really having to struggle and confront who they are as people. We also see Marco challenged by Drummer and Sin, which I really enjoyed. Similar to last week's episode, there are a few things I'm still not loving about the Amos and Clarissa storyline, which I'll get into. But as I mentioned, with the increased focus on character development for both of them this episode, I still thought it was an improvement. With that, let's get into the recap. First, quick reminder, if you're enjoying these videos, please go ahead and hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and hit the bell icon so you get notified the next time we do a video. We start with Avasarala in her office. This whole scene was pretty heartbreaking since, as I mentioned, I don't think we've ever seen her in this state before. She has tears in her eyes and sounds broken when she calls Arjun again and just barely starts her message. She's interrupted by David Pastor, the Minister of Transportation, who reveals he is the the new acting secretary general. He talks about the destruction he witnessed and promises to pull every string he can to try and locate Avasarala's husband. They do a great job here of showing how in over his head David is. He shares his credentials and we know his expertise is in transportation. He's not exactly the man for the job. On top of that, he's not used to off-planet gravity, so he stumbles as he reaches her desk, which creates a great visual of his inexperience. So within seconds, putting the dialogue aside, we already have an impression of this person. David asks if she'll join his provisional cabinet, and she, of course, accepts. After he leaves the room, the camera lingers on Avasarala for about a minute as her hands shake, she puts her jewelry back on, and she attempts to pull herself together. Again, I love this scene, and my only complaint, which is really a compliment, is that I want to see more. I'm very ready to watch Avasarala get back into the fold, see how she responds to Marco, and deals with the massive tragedy on Earth. I think this will be her biggest professional and personal challenge yet, and I'm psyched to see it play out. Next, we'll quickly check in with Holden on the Rossi. They've checked the reactor and hopefully have everything back in working order after Sakai's tampering. Then Monica shows up and insists on coming along for the ride. Bull is against it, but she insists it's thanks to her they even know where the Zamiya is going. Plus, some of Marco's goons are probably still after her, so she's safer on this ship. Bull relents, and they let her stay. Then Holden tells the computer to grant Monica guest privileges only, and I love the detail here where in the background on the computer, you see a big list of privileges, and when he says guest only, you see a bunch of them get grayed out. Finally, Holden notices an unread message from Naomi with the subject, if something goes wrong. My impression is that Naomi left this message before finding Philip and getting mixed up with Marco, meaning she knew there was some risk going into this and wanted to leave something behind for Holden in case things went south. So I'm very curious to see what is in that message. Next, let's talk about Alex and Bobby. Last episode, they dumped their core, meaning they ejected the fusion reactor, the plasma out of their ship. And until that reaction starts back up, they're reliant on thrusters, which would get you a fraction of the speed you get with fusion power. Now that is the least of their problems as they're currently being boarded by a belter ship. As the belters cross the bridge and begin to open the door of the Razorback, Bobby Bobby comes out guns blazing, shooting one of the men in the face. In her Martian power armor, Bobby easily dispatches the men on the bridge and drives any survivors back onto their ship. The belters begin to disconnect from the Razorback and retreat, which is a problem for Alex, who is holding onto the side of their ship. Bobby tries holding the ships together and buy Alex some time. There's a great shot here of her suit being stretched to his limit. Reminiscent of Spider-Man 2. At the last second, Alex plants a bomb in the Belter ship's thruster and leaps back toward the Razorback. Another great moment here as Alex makes his way back to the ship. The Razorback is spinning, so for a second, Alex sees nothing but the void of space. I felt real tension here as getting spaced floating through the empty abyss is something that never gets less scary on this show. 
But Alex reaches the razor back, they get inside and leave victorious. I thought this was a solid moment, but emphasis on the word moment. With so many different POVs in each episode, it is starting to be a bit of a bummer when we get so little screen time for some of the storylines. But again, that's sort of a complaint that's really a compliment because I'm just saying I want to see more. I also just want to add, I kind of love the way the scene started out where we have very little context and then all of a sudden Bobby comes out blasting away and we get this moment of extreme violence. It was a pretty visceral and surprising way to start out the scene. Next, let's go to Marco, Naomi, and Drummer. Marco is very frustrated with Philip. Thanks to Philip bringing Naomi on their ship, she was able to warn Holden about the Gamara Code, saving the Rocinante. When Philip apologizes, Marco demands he space Naomi. Sin butts in and tells him to do it himself. Afterward, Marco gives the lame excuse that he has better things to do. First, I loved Sin shouting at Marco. That was a great emotional release after watching Marco berate his son the last few episodes. I also read a lot into this scene. Last episode, I talked about how a lot of people involved in Marco's plot really don't have an appreciation for the horror of what they've done. They can hear the sentence, you killed millions, but they don't see the children or families they executed. They just hear the statistic. To me, this scene tells us that Marco is the same. He talks about sacrifice, but he won't go kill Naomi right now. And it's hard to imagine a mass murderer hesitating to kill someone, even if he has an emotional attachment to them. But Marco doesn't think of himself as a mass murderer. He doesn't see the full scope of what he's done. To him, those asteroids were a calculated act of war and nothing more than that. And I don't know if he'll ever have his eyes opened to the real tragedy of what he's done, but I think Philip might. Afterward, Philip goes to see Naomi. She learns her crew survived and again tells Philip that Marco made him a murderer. The highlight, though, is when Naomi tells Philip that Marco only loves himself and he wouldn't die for you, but he would let you die for him. That is a brilliant line because it rang so true and it is exactly the sort of thought which could fester in Philip's brain until he turns against his father. It's also very likely that more and more people People will die for Marco's cause, which will just further reinforce that thought for Philip. Eventually, we get to the moment I've been waiting for this episode, Drummer's meeting with Marco. First off, I laughed at Marco's intro, Drummer and Associates. The conversation starts to go south quickly, with Drummer bringing up Marco's murder of Ashford and Fred, but Oksana brings up the future, tries to get them refocused, and asks about food. Currently, they're dependent on Earth, but Marco assures them that agricultural domes will eventually outproduce Earth. Finally, he invites them to join the Free Navy. The biggest highlight for me in this conversation is that Marco believes he already won the war. This is a war we won. For a war you started. For a war I won. Is it over? I must have missed the inner's offer of surrender. And I knew he was cocky, but this sort of crossed the line for me into delusional and naive territory. And I think that will have to be his downfall. He'll trust the wrong person, maybe Philip, or underestimate his enemies and it'll get the best of him. Back on their ship, Drummer and her crew debate their next move. They realize that turning down Marco is a death sentence and they join him. Before Drummer leaves, Marco introduces her to Philip. In their conversation, Drummer's time with Naomi on the behemoth comes up, and when Drummer mentions that Naomi saved every soul in the solar system, Philip says he wants to hear that story. So we start to see that he's warming up to his mother. He also makes it pretty obvious that they have Naomi aboard, and I love the look Marco gives him at that point. So I think Drummer will suspect that Naomi is being held captive, which of course makes this even more personal for her. Right now, she needs to be level-headed going up against Marco, since he is currently in such a position of power, and it'll be interesting to watch her struggle to hold back and not charge in to save her friend after already losing two of them to Marco. Philip heads back to Naomi, though this time he joins her in the cell. He asks her about her time on the behemoth, and she begins telling the story. I loved seeing this. It was sort of the first moment of joy we had for Naomi this season as she finally gets to connect with her son. 
Sadly, I can't see a happy ending for them. Again, Philip is complicit in one of the most heinous acts in history, so I think these few moments of joy are kind of tinged in tragedy, destined to be short-lived. Also, we see Marco watching them on a security camera, so he knows they're bonding, and I think he'll take that out on Philip. He also pulls up an image of Naomi's ship, so it seems he's plotting something to strike back against the two of them. I'm excited to see what it is and also kind of dreading it. As I said, I don't think this ends well for Naomi and Philip. Finally, let's check in on Amos and Peaches. We see them by an aid station, but they can't go in because there are cops and Clarissa is an escaped convict. Amos suggests they take the long hike to Baltimore where he knows the right people to be around in these situations. So I think we'll eventually see a reluctant reunion between Eric and Amos. They begin their hike through the Chesapeake Conservancy Zone, and this is a pretty dialogue-heavy episode for the two of them, which I was very happy with. I mentioned a couple of weeks back that Clarissa is a character I never really connected or sympathized with. Something about killing innocent people or letting them die just sort of rubbed me the wrong way. But this episode started to humanize her for me. And we do see that she is really struggling to live with the things she's done. As they make their way through the woods, Clarissa is surprised to learn that Amos never went to this reforestation area on a school field trip. Which made her seem very naive and out of touch. Just sort of unaware of the privileges she grew up with that not everybody had. Which helped me understand how she could be swayed into her misguided revenge mission. They also discuss their parents. And we get Amos giving Clarissa a small version of the conversation he had with Lydia years ago. There are ways that you can live a good life without being a good person. I think this is an important moment for Clarissa. From the poem we hear from her later, we know she doesn't want to be a bad person. She doesn't want to believe that she is a monster, but that's not enough. She's clearly tortured and doesn't know how to function or live with herself. Versus Amos, who is clearly introspecting and thinking things over, but he gets by just fine. Here, he's trying to tell her how he does that. He tells her essentially, don't worry about am I a good person or not. You know what a good person would do, so just do that. They bump into a guy by a campfire who warns them about a survivalist nearby who is shooting potential trespassers. They leave him, and when Amos checks if he's following them afterward, Clarissa says the guy is harmless, and also notes that Amos seems like he's done this before. He explains, I grew up like this. Everyone else is playing catch-up. People are tribal. The more settled things are, the bigger the tribes can be. The churn comes and the tribes get small again. Right now, you and I are a tribe of two. I thought this episode was filled with some great pieces of dialogue, and that was one of them. It takes an idea which we all intuitively understand. In times of crisis, your circle of trust shrinks. But it puts it in a way you haven't heard before that feels very true and so succinctly describes Amos' mindset. Amos takes them to survivalist guy, and he walks right up to the front door. He pretends they want to trade, but the man goes to kill him anyway. Before he can pull the trigger, Clarissa activates her mods and moves at superhuman speed to kill him. Then she passes out, and Amos brings her inside. I thought her attack looked pretty cheesy, but I figure that's partially a budget thing, so I won't hold it against the show. I will say, though, I mentioned up front that there were some things I didn't love about this storyline, and this survivalist guy is mainly what I was referring to. One of my issues with the prison escape was the convenience built into it, and I think we saw more of that here. What I mean by that is something happens which stretches credulity in a way that seems convenient for the storyline. Because I don't mind if something unrealistic happens, especially in a sci-fi show, except when it benefits our characters in a way that makes things seem too easy. Here, Amos and Clarissa need shelter, supplies, and transportation. So they walk into the woods and boom, some guy tells them, hey, there's somebody nearby with everything you need, and bonus, he's a scumbag. So you can kill him, take all his stuff, and not feel too bad about it. It felt a little like trying to have your cake and eat it too. Amos and Clarissa wonder if it's wrong to kill someone purely for your own benefit, but there's the escape hatch of he was going to kill us first. 
so we look at this moral gray area without having to really dive into it. To be fair, she does point out that they sort of provoked him, so that saves it a little for me, and I like where it ultimately leads from a character standpoint. And that's my feeling on this storyline overall this episode. From a plot standpoint, I didn't love where it went, but on an emotional and character level, which to me is more important, it did work. At the end of the episode, Clarissa points out that going out of your way to murder someone and take their stuff, it's not the kind of thing good people do. It's not even the kind of thing bad people trying to live like good people do. And I loved Amos's response to that. Yeah. Holden never would have approved a move like that. I need to get back to my crew. I think he realizes that as far as he's come, his journey is far from over. He still doesn't quite know how to be an entirely good person, but it's very self-aware of him to note that. He needs to be around others. He needs to get back to his crew who have a little bit of a better idea how to be good. And it made me really excited to see the eventual reunion with Amos and his crew because I'm so curious what their relationship will look like now. He's clearly changed and I think Holden and Naomi will recognize that. I also think they'll be able to help him along on his journey to be good, though I imagine it won't be an easy one. I also think there will be some mixed feelings if he tries to bring Clarissa along. Anyway, I think we can wrap it up there. Like I said, I thought this was a solid episode, and I'm excited to see how things progress in the next four. Let me know what you thought of the episode in the comments. Let me know if you agreed with my take, where you disagreed, and we'll keep the conversation going. And if you enjoyed this video, please go ahead and hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, and hit the bell icon so you get notified when our next video drops. We'll continue to review the show every week, and have some other Expanse related videos on the way, including one deep diving into Fred Johnson's character, so stay tuned for that. With that, thanks for watching, and see you on the next One Take.